You look at the Latinx community, you know, in the U.S., and we are the largest minority here, around 18% continuing to grow. We're also the youngest demographic in the United States. I'm not sure if you knew, but every minute a Latino turns 18, or voting age. So that means that we have our future, the future of this country in our hands, and we are, in fact, defining the future. Latinx Gen Zers, they're doing tremendous work bridging the Latino culture with this new wave of social media on platforms like TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. And what that's resulting is you're seeing a real shift in the attitude towards Latinos around the world. Welcome to Latinx in Power, a podcast hosted by Thaisa Fernandes. Welcome to Latinx in Power podcast. Our goal is to help to demystify tech. The way we do that is by interviewing Latinx leaders all over the world to hear their perspective and insights. Today, we are talking with Luis Curiel. Luis is a friend, a tweep, and the first Latinx person I met on Twitter. He currently sits on the People Team Managing Strategy and Operations, as well as serves as the global co-chair for Twitter Alas, our Latinx business resource group. A first-generation American, he traces his Latinx roots to Honduras. Born and raised in California, he studied biopsychology and worked in agricultural research before making the transition to tech. And Luis, how everything started. Thank you, Thaisa, for that wonderful introduction. So my journey into tech, or just my journey in general, starts very unconventional, right? Growing up in a Latino household, you know, you were always going to be a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer. And in my case, it was definitely medicine. And it really wasn't until I would say my second year at Davis that I was convinced, had strong medicine, med school, that's what I was going to do, that I, that's what I was, you know, destined to do. However, going into college, you know, you're in your university, you want to expose yourself to new things. That was one of my goals very early on. And so if you saw my class schedule in like my freshman and sophomore year, it was just like this confetti of different things that I was trying out, everything from you know, Latinx history classes, I got involved with student government. At some point I was even taking theater classes. So definitely, you know, a freshman in an identity crisis of sorts. But around my second year of college, I needed a job. So I started applying for work. And that's when I got a job as a research assistant for the USDA, the Department of Agriculture, working on specifically plant pathology. Ultimately, that wasn't what I ended up doing with my career, obviously, that's why we're here today. But it definitely showed me and helped me see that there was a lot more that I could be doing besides practicing medicine. It helped me see other professional fields outside of, of your typical traditional fields that you know. But what I will admit was that it was definitely tough having that flexibility and being able to experiment with your career. Because again, growing up in a Latinx household, with a single mom, immigrant mom, who has sacrificed you know, so much to see you succeed, it almost sometimes felt like you might be letting her down or you might be letting the family down and, and not being serious or not being a little bit more linear in your career path. And how did you break into tech? So after I left college, San Francisco is the closest city to my hometown. It's about an hour and a half, two hours from where I'm from. So I knew that was going to be my next destination. Again, I started looking for work. My first job here in the Bay Area was, again, with the USDA, working in a lab, this time in plant genetics. And it was after a year working in this lab when I finally began to seriously consider what am I doing? And is this ultimately what I want to be doing long term? And I knew that I loved working with people and working in a laboratory with plants there's not a lot of people there, right? You know, it's a very solitary job. So, you know, what had been a college gig, I realized, you know, throughout that experience that it wasn't going to be something that I was going to be satisfied long term. And so I started looking for other solutions of what's going to make me happy. Now, the year when this was all happening was 2015. I was in San Francisco. You know, tech was a big part of culture. I would say, I would argue even more than it is today in the city, even if you weren't in the industry. And so one of the things that I did begin to notice was a lot of my friends also coming out of college were beginning to work in tech and specifically within recruiting. So again, here I am considering yet another career move, this time in an area that wasn't even connected to science recruiting. You know, I went home and told my mom and she's like, what is that? Like, what are you doing? Is this why, you know, we sent you to college? So I really needed to think about it long and hard and make sure that this is something that I was going to be able to succeed. But I finally made the jump. I noticed while well, my friends are doing it, some of them are coming from finance, some of them are coming from psychology. 
why can I do it that I'm coming from science? So I asked one of my good friends who was working at a company called Avenue Code for a referral. And sure enough, I got the call to go interview. I still remember that day going into BART, going up financial district, everything just seemed so foreign, like so professional people in their suits. I go into the building, very corporate. And here I come with this resume that reads, you know, plant sciences and like research, like completely foreign, you know, concepts. But what I quickly realized, you know, that interviewing and recruiting in general was really about making that personal connection with who you were talking to, right? Finding that commonality and ultimately having fun. I think if you're having fun, you're being authentic, you're being yourself. So, you know, I went through the interview. It actually went surprisingly well. And, you know, that next day I got the offer. And again, it wasn't an easy, it wasn't a clear choice, but deep down, I knew this was a journey that excited me and that I wanted to go on. So... So, really Nicole, one thing that we have been listening with everyone we talk, basically, is that our career paths, our paths in general, are not linear. And that's okay. That's totally fine. And I see how we can also use the experience and the knowledge we have in different fields to the thing we are doing right now. And this might be what makes us really special. And all those combinations are really interesting. You have a Bachelor of Science in Biopsychology. I'd love to hear more about it and how your degree helped you working in tech, in your opinion. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, I do work in tech, but I work mostly with people, right? I don't necessarily work in engineering. And most folks would say that sciences and plant sciences is unrelated to a people team. But when you look at science, what they call the gold standard in science, it's all about being able to replicate your results. And to achieve that, you need very logical processes and clear documentation. And when you reflect and when you look at how we work today, just in general, you know, at Twitter or in any tech company in a very virtual environment, an empirical process is really key to unlocking better collaboration. It's really important to have good documentation to be able to align with your coworkers. I also think us as humans, we can be messy sometimes, right? And sometimes we might overcomplicate things more than they need to be. And so being, you know, having worked in a lab where everything is very clear, everything is very process oriented, very precise, you get this perspective that you're able sometimes to take a step back when you're in, in your day-to-day -day work and really ask the right questions. What are we trying to achieve? Where is the path of least resistance? Are we overcomplicating things? You're almost able to take out the emotion sometimes out of your work and look at it in a more pragmatic way. And so I see that manifest every day in my work is being able to have that very pragmatic, very practical way of approaching our work. That's so interesting. And also the research background that is always handy. That's really cool. Absolutely. Finding talent is another form of research, right? So, yes. you know, when you're in recruiting, sourcing, that's all research. And what does it mean to be a Latinx for you? This is one of my favorite questions. Actually, it's the question that I always ask my guests and I love all the answers I get. Yeah. I mean, it's my favorite question too. So reflect, I've always grown up being proud of being Latinx, even, you know, since I was a little kid in grade school. For me, being part of this community, being Latinx, it's a superpower, right? The ability to connect with a whole another culture in a very real way. And that sentiment really has continued to grow and evolved as I've grown and evolved in my life. First, you're really able to reflect with much more clarity on your history. Even this year, I had to take a trip back to Honduras and you think, wow, my mother at the age of 15, you know, she was just a little girl, decided to travel across the continent to a foreign country with almost nothing and build a whole family on her own. And that resilience and that strength, what I've discovered is not unique to my mom, it's not unique to my family. You find it in almost every Latinx family across the world. And so for me, it's really an honor, a privilege, and a sense of pride to have that history, you know, be part of me. And also to have the potential to live up to that family legacy and continue to build that family legacy is one of the reasons how I feel connected to the Latinx community. And then second, it's a community, right? It's inevitable to me when I'm walking down the mission here in San Francisco, and I see the Latinos, you know, walking up and down the street. I hear the Spanish, you know, you smell the food, you feel a real sense of belonging. You feel like, wow, I'm home. And that is just so organic, so unforced, just so natural for me. 
where that leads is that belonging also leads to a sense of empowerment, right? You relate to these people and you have these real power in numbers. And that potential within the Latinx community is one of the most exciting things for me personally. You feel like you have this whole army of beautiful people ready to do great things. And it's almost like that, you know, there's this African proverb that says, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together, right? And so that ability to go together with with my community and really build something special, that potential is only so exciting and important in my identity as Latinx. And I love what you said that you always felt proud to be part of the Latinx community. Um, why do you think you were always proud? The reason I'm asking that is because I feel that for a lot of people, the sense of like being proud of our culture is something that they developed over the years. And it might be for like different reasons, right? One of the reasons might be that sometimes we are not thought about like loving our culture or feeling proud of our culture. So we need to develop this sense. And why do you feel that for you was the other way around, which is amazing? Yeah, and I won't say that there weren't times when you try to assimilate to American culture, right? You try to be just like everyone else. But I think it starts with family. And for me, like my family has always been very vociferous, very proud Honduran specifically, right? The food, the music, every morning, every weekend, we wake up to the loud music, ready to clean. And so it was never seen as something that we should hide, something that we should celebrate. And so when I would go to school or, you know, growing up, like the fact that I did have this other area that was mine, but not a lot of people understood. Again, it was just something of pride. Like, let me show you, let me bring you in this beautiful community that you might not know a lot about. I don't know, it starts with family and it just starts with, you know, that uniqueness, I think is really what brings you pride. Amazing, that's beautiful. I love that. And how did your passion for recruiting started? Do you feel it was this connection, like this uh, sense of you can connect more with people? Definitely. I think that's one part of it. Like I said, I love talking to people. I love connecting with people. I think we're social creatures by nature and people love to be connect with one another. But when you say like, when did it turn into a passion? Like working at Avenue Code, I actually felt really well represented at that company. As you know, they've done a terrific job connecting with the Brazilian community. And there was a lot of immigrants in that office. And so it always felt, you know, very homey. But it wasn't until I got to Google and then Twitter when I started to notice that something was really, really off. Either the Latinos were in a different building or we were really, really underrepresented. And so the people that I, you know, starting off in tech in these big companies who I became good friends with were building staff because they were the few Latinos that I knew. They were the few ones that I could speak in Spanish where it felt like I was at home. And so being in recruiting, I knew I was in a position to do something about that, right? Like that is actually my job is to bring people into these companies. And so I think that for me was the moment that my job became a job, something that I do because I knew that I enjoyed it and I was good at it to something much bigger, something that was actually quite a passion of mine and a conviction of mine. Frankly, also very selfishly, that benefited me because I wanted to see more of my people in that building. And so I think, you know, when I look at recruiting today, it's not just about connecting with people, but it's also really advocating for these people that have never been into these buildings and helping them get in the, into the door as well. Yeah, definitely. Because we think about how we need diversity, how we need more people being part of the conversation. And at the same time, when you are part of the conversation, what you can do is also like bring more people to the table, right? Start to opening doors for others, which I think this is the most fascinating and amazing thing, right? Someone opened the doors for you and then you open the door for like many more. So this is like a full cycle, which is beautiful. That's the power. That's where we're, we're all trying to head to. And absolutely, we need to make sure that we're opening those doors as we have those doors open for us, 100%. And which advice would you give to folks who have English as a second language and are currently struggling at work or in their personal life? Yeah, so even though I was born in the U.S., I'm actually an ESL myself. I started school only knowing Spanish. And again, this is another one of those areas where I see speaking a second language as a huge advantage, actually. Like you have so much additional perspective. Like the interesting thing is companies realize this. And that's why they put so much effort into recruiting folks, you know, from other communities, from diverse backgrounds. And so first, 
before I give any advice, what I would say is realize your value and your worth, what you're bringing to the table because you are an ESL and look at it as a superpower, not so much as a candy cap. But I also know that there's challenges, right? With English as a second language, everything seems twice as difficult. And these are really real barriers. Um, and again, I, I'm going to bring us back to earlier this year, I was in Honduras, I was in my grandma's house and I found this old briefcase It looked from like the 60s. And I opened it and it was just this briefcase full of cassettes. And it was an Inglés Sin Barreras course, which is a very popular course here in the U.S. for learning English. We have come such a long way from having to dial a phone number to order a briefcase full of cassettes to begin to learn English, right? Like there's just so much content out there, apps like Duolingo, videos on YouTube, music is at our disposal. So just leverage all the media that we have and really take advantage there. Also remember your colleagues. You know, back in Google, there was a language exchange program where I met one of my good friends. She was trying to learn Spanish. I was trying to practice my French. And so we were able to connect. So, you know, there is a very good chance if you work in a company, an American company or a company with English speaking coworkers, that they would love to partner in helping you practice, you know, your English speaking skills. And you in turn, you know, could very well help them learn a new language. And then finally, we are moving towards an asynchronous virtual work style. And what that means is there's gonna be a lot more documentation, a lot more written communication. And so use this to your advantage. If you're having a meeting, if you're having a presentation and you're worried about your English, right? You know, set up an agenda, set up those notes, set out those slides ahead of the meeting. So there is not as much pressure on you to communicate the content. Really, you are just summarizing what they've already seen. Use that written communication as much as possible. It's gonna become more and more mainstream. And so I think this is gonna be a huge advantage for anyone that speaks English as a second language. I love your tips. And one thing that I think it's amazing and really interesting to also like keep in mind is to that reinforces the importance of have diverse companies, diverse teams, but also diverse friends, right? Because sometimes we can control where we work, but we can have diverse friends. And I think the accent, it's a big thing for folks who has like English as a second language and getting used to having different accents, because let's be real, everyone has an accent. So let's get used to that. And I think one thing that I love about this podcast is like everyone we interview we have a lot of different accents. So sometimes I have friends or colleagues or listeners who message me that says, oh, this is really nice because there's different accents. And I have actually some English teachers using this podcast to refer to their like students because they can get used to listen to different accents, not just like British American accents or like you know, different people who has English as a second language. So I love that too. And I think it's something really good to ourselves to understand that it's okay, we have an accent, but everyone has it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, 100%. And I think it's easy for us being in the United States to know that, you know, that there is so many different accents. I saw this, you know, being part of Twitter Alice, I had the opportunity to visit our Mexico City office and visit our Sao Paulo office. And I found that this was one of the concerns, you know, Tweeps there had was, you know, their English. And they were so self-conscious of it because they don't have as much awareness that, to your point, here in America, everyone speaks English with an accent. It's actually quite common. Actually, some of the English, you know, that I heard in Latin America was a lot, you know, clearer to understand than some of the English that we hear here. And so just bringing that awareness to Latin Americans, you know, if that is the concern, you know, working for an American company. And then the other thing I would say is bringing that awareness back to the US, to our headquarters. And, and I'm using, you know, Twitter as an example, just because that's where I've been involved with. But I think there is unintentionally some unawareness with the fact of some of these concerns of our peers in other countries, right? The fact that there might be some hesitation because of their English. And so I think if we're able to bring that awareness, we can also unlock more resources. We can unlock at least more of an understanding. And so I think it's a twofold conversation of, yes, there is many different types of English. And that's why English is an international language. And hey, heads up, if you're in America and you're, you know, you're trying to be this global company, know that there is going to be concerns and there are going to be language barriers and we all have to work together and create solutions. In our conversation, we talked about the sense of what is next. 
and how we can start lifting others. And I love to bring your perspective. What are your thoughts about it? Yeah, so like starting off with just the first question on what's next, you look at the Latinx community, you know, in the US and we are the largest minority here, around 18% continuing to grow. We're also the youngest demographic in the United States. Not sure if you knew, but every minute a Latino turns 18 or voting age. So that means that we have our future, the future of this country in our hands. And we are in fact defining the future. Latinx Gen Zers, they're doing tremendous work bridging the Latino culture with this new wave of social media on platforms like TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. And what that's resulting is you're seeing a real shift in the attitude towards Latinos around the world. Latinx representation in marketing is a great example of this. You're seeing major brands like Crocs do a collaboration with Bad Bunny. You're seeing McDonald's place their bets on J Balvin. You know, this would have been unheard of 10, 15 years ago. And the same is happening in tech. Years ago, you know, when I started off in 2015, you would have struggled to find 30 people in tech and put them in a room. Now, when we have our, you know, all those events, tech events, you fill these rooms to capacity where we have to turn people away. But that's not enough. We need to make sure that we are also paving the way for the next generation, right? We cannot just be satisfied with being represented or being here. We need to make sure that we have a seat at the table and the big table at that. That ultimately is what's going to result in more opportunities and generational change for the Latinx community here and in Latin America. And speaking about Latin America, we need to talk more about it. They are the nearest neighbors to the United States and the entrepreneurship that is happening in cities like Mexico City, Monterrey, Lima, Belo Horizonte, Sao Paulo is really exciting. And so it's our job as we have already made it into tech, we have a voice within these companies to use our voice, to redirect, to bring awareness to these places, to bring awareness to the ingenuity and the entrepreneurship that is happening there. And also to hold our leaders accountable. Representation is a huge piece of this. Again, we need to make sure that we're not just focusing on filling you know, quotas or filling our demographic needs. We need to make sure that we're looking at the full picture. Where is our leadership represented? Who is in our board of directors? Who is in our staff? We need to look, you know, how our Latinx sweeps are growing within the community, within the tech industry and beyond. And then there are things that we can do on a personal level, right? I think, you know, I've been on hiring panels. I've been on interviewing panels for my team, you know, ensuring that we're holding our teams accountable on how we're looking at candidates, how we're opening opportunities for others, how we're assessing candidates, ensuring that these opportunities are available to everyone and not just members of the team. There's so much that we can do internally that now that we have representation, that we're in the door to bring others along. And then the last thing I would say is I remember starting off even when I was in Avenue Code, companies like Google and Twitter seemed like these huge, you know, fortresses where I never knew what happened behind those closed doors. It felt magical, but it also felt scary and intimidating to a certain extent. I think us that have made it, that are represented, it is our job to bring some of those barriers down, show folks what the interview process looks like at a tech company, talk about what is it that they look for, help them on their resumes represent themselves in a way that is gonna resonate with our teams. I think we all have certain perspectives that can really guide into this next generation of Latinx folks that also want to make it into the industry. Amazing. I love your summary. Like you talked about everything and you also brought the positive side of things, which I think it's something that a lot of times we forget because there's a lot of work that we still need to do. There's a lot more, but it's always good to think about the good things that happen. So thank you for that. That was amazing. Thank you. No, absolutely. It's exciting. Yeah. It's, not, it's amazing and it's exciting, right? You know, it's what you want to see. We just got to keep moving forward. Yes, let's do it. In this season, this year, I'm always asking my guests, what are the resources that help them in their journey? So I'd love to hear from you. It can be anything. So I will say, you know, I'll start with the easy ones. And what I've noticed on social media, our community has really shown through. And for me, living in San Francisco away from my family, I miss, you know, hearing the Spanish television. I miss being around, you know, the Latino culture. And so being able to, you know, look at sites like Remezcla, Me Too, these Spanish mediums are just, they're highlighting it from our perspective. It's just so refreshing. And then also, you know, what I've noticed in social 
social media is there's communities that have been underserved even within the Latinx community that are finally starting to have awareness. One of those that comes to mind in Honduras is the Garifuna community. And seeing the Garifuna community online on platforms like Instagram and Twitter educate the public, show them who they are, has helped me on a personal level better educate myself on this huge diverse community we call Latinx, but also help educate my friends, my family that may not know you know, who these underserved communities are. In terms of books, I have three. One that I would recommend is The Open Veins of Latin America. I think every Latinx person should, actually, I think everyone should read this book because it helps understand the history of our continent, where we've been, why, you know, decisions have been made and really helps us look forward on how we can move together and progress as a community. It's a history book, so be forewarned, but I would definitely highly recommend. The second one is not related to being Latinx at all. It's actually a little bit more political in nature, but it's called The Righteous Mind. And the full title is Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. And so it seems really loaded in a certain sense it is. But I, the reason why I wanted to share this book is as Latinos, and even more so as Latinos that may have immigrated to this country, it is so incumbent and important for us to be able to relate to others, both in our professional lives and in our personal lives. But it can be hard to do, right? Coming from a different country, coming from a different place, different culture, it's hard to relate to other communities and other cultures. And so I like this book is because it breaks it down by values, what people are motivated by and how there's different motivations from different people. You never go into a room you know, with an argument or with a viewpoint with your own values, because that's not going to resonate with you, Thaisa. I want to go into a room with my argument, but understanding your values and being able to use those values and leverage those values to the points I'm trying to make. And so I just think it's a really good book that lays it out, just how people are different, how people might be divided, but also how we can connect closer together. And then the last one is a little bit more of a fun one. It's been quite a year and a half. I'm a big Lin-Manuel Miranda fan, and he has this cute little book. It's called Good Morning and Good Night. And it's just positive affirmations for you that you're supposed to read in the morning and you're supposed to read in the night. I'll just read you one real quick. Yeah. This one says, good morning, courage, even when the panic's at the back of your throat, courage, let's go. So you read that in the morning and then it's a picture of a line. And then at night you read, good night, courage, even when fear is at the foot of your bed, courage, let's go. So it's just very short, you know, each section is one, something you read in the morning, something you read at night, but it's super cute and just something positive to bring, you know, a little joy to your day. Amazing. I loved all your tips and I'm definitely going to read all those books. I love when people recommend books and actually the open veins of Latin America. It is in my list for a long, long time. And now this is the time I'm going to read it. Like it's going to be my next book. Thank you so much, Luis. That was amazing. I want to leave the last minutes for you to share anything you want to share with us. And thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Saisa. It's awesome. Like I said, I, I really appreciate you doing this. Latinx in power is such an important concept I and mean, something that we're all living today. I think what's most exciting is, like I mentioned earlier, we're starting to see this shift and turn within our community and the potential is there. It's up to each of us to take hold of it and finally to lift each other and, and lift our community up. But I'm excited. I'm honored that you invited me. Um, let's go. Let's keep it going. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, thank you. That's it for today, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it. I really like to hear Luis' tips and his recommendations. I wish I heard some of them seven years ago when I moved to the West. But anyways, I hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to message us on Twitter and LinkedIn and also Instagram. And our next episode is actually a bonus. So I'm really excited about it. I'm bringing two amazing friends and we are having a conversation about decolonizing design. So stay tuned for that and see you soon. Mm -hmm.